This week's been a truly momentous week in American politics. No, I'm not talking about the news that John Bolton is about to testify in the impeachment hearing of his former boss. No, no, something much more important to the long-term prosperity of the American people. On Tuesday the 22nd of October 2019, more than 200 mayors across the US sent a letter urging Congress to pass a five-year extension of the Solar Investment Tax Credit, or ITC, with a particular focus on creating jobs and drawing investment. In fact, it was a total of 231 Democrat and Republican mayors from 39 states asking Congress to pass a bill called the Renewable Energy Extension Act. And more than 60 of those mayors are from districts that have a Republican member of Congress. The letter states, mayors across the country increasingly support renewable energy. The communities we serve, including residents and local businesses, have seen the rewards of investing in technology like solar. Year after year, we've seen the number of solar installations grow in our towns and cities. Adoption of renewable energy has accelerated as a result of policies such as the investment tax credit, which has made it possible for far more people in more places to choose solar energy and lower electricity bills. This is of course great news in itself, but it also highlights a growing global movement. When it comes to rapid and urgent climate mitigation policy, national governments around the world are paralysed by the financial clout and lobbying power of the fossil fuel industry, while individuals like you and me can often feel like our own personal efforts and sacrifices are a bit pointless in the face of this seemingly immovable obstacle, and as a result, many people give up before they even start. But now, increasingly occupying the gaping void between these two extremes are the local municipal leaders not only in America, but all over the world. So could it be that history will demonstrate that the real champions of climate change mitigation in the 21st century were our very own city mayors? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. By 2050, more than two thirds of the world's population will live in cities. According to this recent article by ED.net, 30 of the world's largest cities, including London, New York and Copenhagen, have now reached a peak in their greenhouse gas emissions. Not only have they peaked, but they've actually reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by an average of 22%, directly improving the lives of 58 million people who live and work in those communities. That analysis comes from perhaps the most proactive and influential organisation you may never have heard of, an organisation called C40. The C40, otherwise known as the City's Climate Leadership Group, was actually started back in 2005. On December the 8th, 2014, the C40, together with the World Resources Institute and the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, published a set of standardised global rules for cities to measure and publicly report their carbon pollution emissions. Amazingly, it was called the Global Protocol for Community-Scale Greenhouse Gas Emission Inventories, which they very smartly shortened to GPC. It formed a baseline measure which allowed the formation of a partner group now known as the Global Covenant of Mayors. By 2015, these organisations had become an influential voice in the construction of the Paris Climate Agreement which, as I'm sure you know, aims to keep average global atmospheric temperature rises to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels, with the higher aspiration of keeping them down to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Today, the C40 consists of 94 cities around the world, including 12 key cities in the United States and eight of the largest cities in China. Together, these cities represent a twelfth of the world's entire population and a quarter of the global economy. Here's C40 Executive Director Mark Watts speaking back in 2016. It's quite a short period, but that post-war boom, which is in the West responsible for so many extraordinary leaps forward in terms of, of human well-being uh, and, and health uh, and development, also gave us the, the model of the 
I'm afraid, North American sprawling city designed for cars where everybody needs to have half an acre and a, and a plot of land. And we now know it just doesn't work. It can't work for, for 7 billion people. It, it never worked for 5 billion. Commenting on the latest analysis, what says the C40 cities that have reached peak emissions are raising the bar for climate ambition and at the same time exemplifying how climate action creates healthier, more equitable and resilient communities. But he points out that this is nothing to win medals for. In fact, he says that emissions around the whole world will need to stop rising and start falling in the next 12 months or so if we're to stand any chance at all of keeping global temperature rises below 1.5 degrees Celsius. With the vast amount of expertise and resources now available through the C40 Knowledge Hub, says Watts, we're gonna see even more cities accelerating their climate action to limit global heating and deliver the future we want. At the United Nations Climate Conference in Paris in 2015, the C40 members enacted a program called Deadline 2020. Here's what it says. Number one, emissions from the residents of the C40 cities must reduce from five tonnes of CO2 equivalent per person per year in 2015 to 2.9 tonnes in 2030 and all the way down to net zero by 2050. Number two, $375 billion of investment is required between 2015 and 2020 and over a trillion dollars will be needed by 2050 to invest in renewing and expanding infrastructure and working to enhance the quality of life of citizens. Number three, on top of the 11,000 climate actions already taken between 2005 and 2016, an additional 14,000 actions are required between 2016 and 2020 representing an additional 125% in less than half the time. Number four, the highest emitters must do the most. Of the 14,000 actions set out by the C40, 71% must be taken by cities with a GDP over $15,000 per person. Number five, city mayors have a direct responsibility to deliver or influence over half of the savings needed to put C40 cities on a 1.5 degree trajectory, including a reduction of 525 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2100, either through direct action or via collaboration with partners such as the private sector. Number six, action to deliver structural changes from outside our cities, like electrical grid decarbonisation, must start to have a significant impact from 2023 at the latest. This will take over as the dominant driver of urban greenhouse gas reductions after 2030. Number seven, substantial carbon sequestration will also be required by national governments if cities are to stay on a 1.5 degree trajectory post 2050. Number eight, if all cities with a population greater than 100,000 adopt the C40 plan, they could save 863 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent globally by 2050. This would mean that the mega cities of the world would have contributed around 40% of the reductions necessary for a 1.5 degree scenario. In an effort to turbocharge ambition, the 2018 Global Climate Summit in San Francisco urged cities to step up to the challenge in a far more aggressive way, calling for a commitment to 100% renewable electricity citywide by 2035, and 100% renewable energy, which includes electricity, but also heating and cooling and transport by 2050. And so new initiatives were enacted. Initiatives like the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration, where cities pledged to procure only zero emission buses by 2025, making major areas of those cities zero emissions by 2030 and encouraging a shift to walking, cycling and public transport. And then there was the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Declaration. Building energy use accounted for over half of total 2018 city emissions. By signing up to this declaration, cities committed to enacting regulations and planning policies to ensure new buildings operate at net zero carbon by 2030, with all buildings to follow by 2050. And the third leg of this urban climate mitigation commitment extravaganza was a declaration called Advancing Towards Zero Waste, where cities pledged to reduce the amount of waste generated by at least 15% per capita by 2030. 
And they also committed to reducing the amount of municipal solid waste disposed of to landfill or incineration by at least 50% and increase the diversion rate away from landfill and incineration to at least 70% by 2030. So here we are in October 2019 and the obvious question is how are we doing? Well, the ED report does contain some glimmers of hope. It tells us that in total, half of all C40 cities have either already reached peak emissions, are projected to achieve peak emissions by 2020, or have made public commitments to do so. More than 66,000 electric buses are now in operation within these cities, compared to fewer than 100 buses just 10 years ago. 17 cities have placed restrictions on high polluting vehicles compared to only three in 2009. 82 cities have implemented cycle hire schemes compared to only 13 in 2009. 24 cities have committed to 100% renewable energy by 2030. And 18 cities have banned or restricted the use of non-recyclable plastics compared to just two in 2009. Not bad, but clearly nowhere near good enough. Here's a face that most of us will recognise. It's Al Gore, former Vice President of the United States of America and creator of the 2006 docufilm An Inconvenient Truth. You know, the one where he gets a little bit ahead of his skis on the whole does CO2 lead or follow temperature increases in the geological record thing. For clarity, sometimes it follows, sometimes it leads, depending on what else is happening at the time but it always amplifies and accelerates the change. And right now, 7.6 billion human beings are making damn sure that CO2 is emphatically leading, not following. Anyway, Big Al is still banging the drum for climate change mitigation, and he took center stage at the 2019 C40 conference held in Copenhagen, Denmark, between October 9th and October 12th. He may be 71 years old now, but my God, he hasn't lost any of the fire in that Washington DC belly of his. Have a listen to this. The answer to that first question, must we change? Yes, we have to change. This is our generation's life or death battle. Think back through the histories of the cities represented here and the nations uh, they are found in, times in the past where heroism made the difference in a crucial battle that defined history. The whole world is facing just those circumstances right now. So to help our municipal leaders comply with Mr. Gore's exaltations, the C40 produced a comprehensive online dashboard tool that each of their member cities can consult to determine the size of their remaining challenge. Because in the words of the old cliche, what gets measured gets done. For the more visually orientated civic representatives, the data can be analysed graphically on a world map where city emissions are split into three categories. Stationary energy in blue, transportation in red and waste in green. All the icons are clickable to bring up data on that particular city, enabling the user to navigate their way around the globe to identify and assess progress in their own neck of the woods. For those of a more numerically analytical leaning, a traditional spreadsheet style presentation of data is also available, this time with a drop down box to take you to your chosen city and then quite a bit of drill down into the various subcategories of domestic, commercial and industrial emission sources with statistical information revealing each category's contribution to the overall emissions total. And for the graph nerds like me, there's a comparative bar chart showing how each city compares to all the others in the C40 group. My city is London, and with a population of over 8 million people, it's always going to be at the higher end of the scale. But the chart also clearly shows me that despite some good work like the congestion charge and the more recent introduction by Mayor Sadiq Khan of the Ultra Low Emission Zone, or ULES, the English capital still has a big challenge to get the energy use and emissions from its domestic and commercial buildings reduced dramatically if it's to meet its obligations under the Paris Agreement. To add even further clarity to the mix, the great global data gathering overlord that we all call Google has also created an online analysis tool called the Environmental Insights Explorer. The EIE was created in partnership with the Global Covenant of Mayors that we mentioned earlier on. 
There, an international alliance of almost 10,000 cities around the world, representing well over 750 million people, or about 10% of the total global population. This typically intelligent Google software analyzes information from Google Maps to provide free datasets across building and transportation emissions, as well as analysis of energy offset potential and 20-year climate projections to enable city planners to create carbon baselines, identify reduction opportunities, and explore new measures to set meaningful emission reductions targets. Here's Rebecca Moore, director of Google Earth. Google is a company that organizes the world's information. How can we fill gaps in knowledge about climate change that is informed by data, informed by science, and likely to have a positive effect? The planet is changing dramatically. Cities are a critical part of reducing those emissions, and yet the cities have not had the data. The sobering truth is that as a global society, we humans are miles off target to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to levels that'll guarantee a safe passage through the 21st century and beyond. Our current trajectory takes us to at least four degrees Celsius of extra warming by 2100, which essentially makes about 50% of the planet's land mass uninhabitable. And that of course means that countless species of animals will become extinct and billions of human beings will lose their homes and their livelihoods and a large proportion of those human beings will die before their time as a direct consequence. So if our national leaders are proving ineffective and each of us feel that our own individual efforts are too inconsequential in the face of these overwhelming odds, then perhaps the solution really does lie in getting involved in local initiatives and civic action in your own town or city. Because right now, that looks like the most effective conduit for genuine change we have in our collective armory. That's it for this week. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the program useful. And if you did, then you can help us to keep making these videos by subscribing to the channel to raise our profile with the ever more selective YouTube search algorithms. Your support really does make a huge difference. And of course, it costs you precisely nothing. All you have to do is click on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.